Well, good morning, Austinville. It's exciting to be here. And um, yeah, it's like coming home for sure. Although when I look around and I had to dig Rob in the uh, ribs and say, is that Maya and Zebedee? Because I think last time I saw Zebedee, he was probably, is there a new one? Is there a new one? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, as all the Kingstons, they're like rabbits. They just keep breeding. It's um, pretty exciting. Yeah. And um, Joel and Kelly, well done. Adding to the clan. It's fantastic. It's good to be here. Let's just pray before we begin. Father in heaven, thank you so much for the privilege of being here and of opening your word. Lord, as we contemplate one of the most difficult passages in the Bible to fully understand, pray that your spirit would be here to bring from the text something that changes who we are and helps us to influence those around us. In Jesus' name, amen. It's grainy, I know. Most photos in newspapers last century were. Does anybody recognise the two people that are there? Paul Keating and Her Majesty, Queen Elizabeth II. In 1992, Paul Keating attracted the wrath of the British press when he dared put his arm around Queen Elizabeth. For those of you who have got good memories, you will remember that the English press dubbed our Prime Minister the Lizard of Oz. <laughs> In 2018, another well-known celebrity, Lady Gaga, showed us how it ought to be done. When you're in the presence of royalty, you curtsy or bow according to your preferred gender. Respect must be shown to the monarch. Australians, as a general rule, don't pay much attention to etiquette. We have some Bible workers who live on our property just down the road, and I regularly inform them as they cycle through that you will know you are a fully integrated Australian when people start insulting you. We are polite and we are considerate as a people. But we sometimes show respect and appreciation for each other by calling each other names that other more civilised cultures would regard as savagery. When somebody gives us a deprecating remark, we know we are the closest of friends. And when Roz asked me whether I would come to Alstonville and preach on Daniel 11, I felt like saying back down the phone, thank you, Auntie Roz, for I know that she does not like that term of endearment. She's Roz, for those of you who haven't noticed. Daniel 10 to 12 form a literary unit in the Old Testament. And Daniel 10 is a brilliant chapter which, which has, has just the most amazing passages of how Daniel is greatly beloved. And when he's on his knees, heaven is moved and angels are sent to give him understanding and comfort and encouragement. And Daniel 12 is a magnificent chapter which speaks of Michael standing up and people being resurrected and, and God's people being delivered and the faithful being redeemed. But the messy bit, Daniel 11, the bit in the middle, has been regarded by one of Adventism's most eloquent and gifted scholars as one of the most difficult passages to interpret as far as historical events are known. I'm not here this morning to settle any long-held differences over the book of Daniel 11. But I, what I do want to encourage you is to recognise that even though Daniel 11 can be quite a difficult passage to pass and pin down, there are blessings in it for sure. In the opening verse of the passage Daniel 10 to 12, we read that the vision that Daniel received was a vision which was going to speak 
to times of war and great hardship. When you get an advertising brochure for an overseas boat cruise from Budapest to wherever it ends up, Vienna, they're usually blue skies, still rivers, and the, the, the marketing of the, the appeal to consume your tourist dollars is caged in terms that make it look delicious. But those of you who have travelled the world will sometimes know that when you end up at that place that you had seen in the brochure, you almost wonder whether Photoshop and Airbrush had changed what you are seeing from the reality that was marketed to you in the beginning. And Daniel 11 is one of those advertising brochures that is reality and it is raw. Daniel is on his knees and he's praying to the God of heaven to understand what is about to happen and an angel is sent to him to give him a vision and the vision describes times of war and great hardship. Jeremiah had predicted earlier on in the history of the Israel, Israelite nation, more specifically the nation of Judah, which was all that was left after the rest of the 11 tribes had been incorporated and assimilated into the Assyrian Empire. The small remnant of believers that were left were, were told by Jeremiah that they were going to face 70 years of discipline. But at the end of the 70 years of discipline in Babylonian captivity, that something amazing would happen and God would liberate them and bring them back to their own land. How was this to be accomplished? It was to be accomplished through a man named Cyrus. And Anita, I noticed that you're going through the book of Isaiah. And as you go through the book of Isaiah, you'll get this sense that God had chosen this person in history called, uh, called Cyrus to become a Messiah-type figure to rescue and redeem the nation of Israel from their 70 years of discipline. Cyrus made it not only possible for the Jews to return to Jerusalem through his decree, he also enabled the Israelites and the, the people of the, of the nation of Judah to go back to Jerusalem well-resourced in order to rebuild and restore their fortunes. The Bible tells us that the neighbours of the Jews would contribute towards their expenses by giving them silver and gold. Has any of your neighbour ever left, leant over your fence and said, have some of my silver and gold? It would be remarkable, wouldn't it? This was the new Exodus. You will remember at the time of Exodus that God moved upon the people of Egypt to load up the children of Israel who had been there in slavery for centuries with the accumulated wealth of Egypt. And when the children of Israel were finally out into the desert and they wanted to build a sanctuary, Moses had to give a command to the 12 tribes to stop bringing the wealth of Egypt because they had more than enough. What Adventist church treasurer would do to be in that space where they had to put an announcement on the big screen, please stop giving your offerings, we don't know how to spend it. Throughout history, there are those moments where the advertising brochure is airbrushed and the colours are increased in saturation and the, the grain is taken out of the photo and we look at it and we go, this is amazing. God has turned up into human history and amazing things are happening. Most Christians know and love Jeremiah 29.11. Who here has Jeremiah 29.11 as their favourite verse? Nobody. That is incredibly unusual. After John 3.16, Jeremiah 29.11 is the second most quoted favourite verse of all of the texts in the Bible. For I know the plans I have towards you, plans to prosper you and to give you hope, plans of peace, not to harm you. You've all heard that text? You can buy it on mugs, you can have it cross-stitched on a canvas, you can have it emblazoned on your T-shirt. There are Christians by the millions that have it on baseball caps and bumper stickers and America 
knows this text. But like many of the well-known texts, they know the text, but they don't know the context. And this is a text where when read in context is a promise for your grandchildren or your great-grandchildren. It is not your personal privilege to claim Jeremiah 29, 11 as your own. God had said to the children of Israel, you are going to go into Babylon for 70 years and your grandchildren may forget who you are and what you believe. But I want to tell you that when your grandchildren turn up, that I have not forgotten to be faithful. And I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster. I will give you a future and a hope. I will bring you home again. Now, Daniel, who was taken to Babylon as a very young teenager... He is now in his 80s or 90s and a very old man. And he has been lucky enough to live, to see the decree of Cyrus, who says the 70 years are up. This is the time for peace and prosperity. This is the time for a future with hope. And he gets a vision. And the vision is of times of war and great hardship. There are some things that many young children do that I have never done. When you get in the car and you say, decide you're gonna drive to Melbourne to watch the Grand Prix, and you're around Woodburn, and your two and a half year old says, Daddy, are we there yet? Who has had that experience with young children? Are we there yet? The Jews were kind of, in a spiritual sense, constantly saying to God, are we there yet? Are we there yet? And can you imagine, here is Daniel in the third year of Cyrus, Cyrus, the, the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem has been issued. And a number of the, the Jews have made their way back to Jerusalem and it is, it is a broken city, it's a destroyed city, it is a decimated city. But they're claiming the promise of Jeremiah and they're saying, 70 years ago you told us that you know the plans you have for us. They're plans to prosper us and to give us hope. And here we are in a broken down city, but we've got gold and we've got silver and we've got a king on our side. Let's make Israel great again. And Daniel gets a vision, and it's a vision of war and hardship. We say, are we there yet? The Israelites and Jews would say, God, how long? How long? How long before the advertising brochure becomes the reality we are living in? How long before the promises are actually realized in our day-to-day Life. Daniel 11 is, as it were, the roadmap that God throws into the seat behind the driver and says, Hey, kids, check it out. There's seven rivers we need to cross, there's three mountain ranges we need to go over, there's two big cities that we need to drive past. You can get a sense of where we are up to in the journey by seeing and ticking off those landmarks which tell us that we are still on track. And while we may not be there yet, we're closer than we were when we left. And it's sooner than it was before. Along our Christian journey, God speaks to us with gentle reminders that we need to trust and have patience. 
When God gave Daniel visions that seemed to stretch time, Daniel would fall on his knees. And in Daniel 8, when he hears of this long time period before the sanctuary is going to be restored, he falls on his knees and he says, Come on, God, are we there yet? How long? You've promised, and now you've given me a vision which seems to be stretching time. Come on, God, don't delay. Your people and your city bear your name. You know, I love Bible prophecy. Bible prophecy for me is the, that objective outline that helps us to place ourselves so that when it looks like we have been derailed or are on a detour, we can examine what God has said and recognise that we are still on track. The journey for God's people is not going to be all about rainbows and butterflies. The future for God's people would indeed be times of war and great hardship. And Daniel 11, while having difficult passages to pass and place, is clear about one thing. No kingdom that annoys or frustrates the Jews will ever be a permanent obstacle to God having his way. Cyrus, the Persian king, became a Messiah figure in the story of the Jews. And Daniel 11 opens with an insight that we must never forget. Daniel's visions and Daniel's narrative stories tell us that God actually messes in the human story. God was active in the story of Nebuchadnezzar. He showed up in the story of Nebuchadnezzar's grandson, Belshazzar. He was there in the story of Darius the Mede. Daniel 11 peels back the curtain between the material and the divine and we see angels and divine beings supporting and holding to account the major political figures of the day. When God found Belshazzar wanting, he supported Cyrus and there was a transition in the kingdom that ruled the then known world. In the opening verse of Daniel 11, we have this insight that Michael, one who is like God, and the angel who is speaking to Daniel, have been wrestling with Cyrus, wrestling with Darius, in order to fulfill the vision that Jeremiah had been given for the deliverance of Israel. And as we move into the, the literary unit of Daniel 10 to the end of, the, of um, chapter 12, we find that God is active in the affairs of men. Is that good news? It's incredibly good news. It tells us when despots and autocrats rise to the throne, when hegemony becomes the norm, that God is still in the ultimate control of his universe. And if and when it becomes necessary for him to step in in order to rescue and redeem his beloved people, he can and he will. The book of Daniel indicates to us that God is active in the space of prospering kingdoms and also calling them to account. Sarias the Persian and Darius the Mede work to deliver the Jews from captivity and allow them to return and rebuild Jerusalem. When we read Cyrus' decree in the opening verses of Ezra, we find that he was stirred by the Lord to bring about the situation that would enable the Jews to go free. God was busy at the beginning of the kingdom of the Medes and Persians and now Daniel is told in Daniel 11 that three more kings would follow and a fourth far richer than the others. What happens to people when they get too much money? We have a um, very, very lovely 
ophthalmologist who lives in our region. Um, if he's listening online, I'd like to send out a cheer to Dr. Rodwell. Um, Zeke will be following in his footsteps. And um, back in the old days when cataract surgery was incredibly complex and incredibly difficult, Medicare agreed that it was fitting for an ophthalmologist to charge $3,000 to treat a cataract. When I operate in St Vincent's Hospital on the Friday morning, Dr Rodwell often follows me and I look at his list. And I do four cases of wisdom teeth and I might be lucky to take home a total of $8,000 for a day of operation and feel myself privileged indeed. And then I see that Dr Rodwell has 21 cataracts to do. And I think 21 times 3, that's 60 something thousand dollars that he's going to collect in one afternoon of operations. Dr Rodwell has bought, as far as possible, something from every element on the periodic table that he can find. He has in his possession a German tank from World War II. Dr Rodwell is a lovely man and I'm not casting aspersions on his eclectic tastes or his opportunities to do amazing things with the excess capital he's able to generate from his profession. But there are other affluent and wealthy people that I have met that sometimes do incredibly crazy things with their money. We buried one of my very good friends who has a tree farm up on the hill in Alstonville. And Robert Donato had a fascination with model trains. So he built a shed, 20 metres by 20 metres, and began to build himself a model railway. And his brother-in-law estimates that he has spent in excess of $300,000 on building his model railway. Who wants to be in the space where they have that kind of disposable cash? Sometimes we find people, unlike Robert and my good friend Dr Rodwell, who have very eclectic tastes and sometimes they use their money for nefarious ends. And as a general observation, when people become too rich and too powerful, they stop understanding what it's like to live a normal life and they can move away from being kind rulers to cruel rulers. Have you seen that happen? Distance from the reality of the people that they are ministering to and serving, they end up finding that privilege and power become agents of corruption. You've all heard the saying that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And what we are going to find in the book of Daniel is that kingdoms that start off with pure intentions kind to their people, democratic and establishing and protecting freedom over the six series of generations like David through to Solomon and then Rehoboam move from being gregarious, kind, generous, just rulers to saying my um, father's little finger will be nothing compared to what I'm going to do for you. He might have whipped you with whips, I'm going to whip you with scorpions. And we all know from the history of the Israelite nation that when Rehoboam stood up and abused his position of power and privilege, what happened to his kingdom? It fell apart. And this is what we are going to find happens in Daniel 11. There would be three more kings according to the opening verses of Daniel 11 and then there would be a new king who would turn up. We know from history that after the three kings, after Cyrus and Darius, um, Darius, there was a king called Alexander the Great from the Greek Empire that came through and he tore through the empire. History tells us that Alexander the Great cried when he had finished decimating the Persian Empire because he felt there was no more wars that he could win but struck down in his early 30s. The Bible tells us with absolute accuracy that his kingdom would not be given to his children, but instead would be divided to the four winds of heaven and Alexander's four generals took over the kingdom 
And from there, Daniel 11 begins to describe for us petty spats between the kings of the north and the kings of the south. Most Bible commentators would agree that when we're talking about kings of the north and kings of the south, we're referring to the divisions of Alexander's empire and in reality the kingdoms above Jerusalem were referred to as the king of the north and the kingdoms like Egypt to the south of Jerusalem were referred to the kings of the south. And we have cycles in Daniel 11 of the king of the north maintaining dominance and then the king of the south maintaining dominance. And there's this constant interplay of going back and forth. And if you are a history buff and not a dentist, you will probably be able to read Daniel 11 and be amazed as it speaks in metaphorical terms of, of the spats that happen between the Antiochuses and the Seleucids and be, with Characters like Berenice and Laodas and um, Alexander um, and we move on to Julius Caesar and Titus and all of these people have been seen in the spats that happen around the geographical wars that happened from the north and the south. And you might wonder at my cryptic introduction. Why is it that Lady Gaga bowing before the Queen becomes the chosen metaphor for Glenn's exposition on Daniel 11. Why could I not, like a good Aussie, use instead Paul Keating? What is it about Australian culture that makes us too savage to understand what's happening in Daniel 11? Let me explain the cryptic nature of this metaphor. In Daniel, kingdoms rise and fall. When a kingdom is elevated, it is in a position of dominion. When it bows or falls down, it is in a position of submission. I've never had to bow down to anyone in Australia. I've never really given it much thought, but there's a really good chance that I'm a closet Republican. That were the monarch to enter the room, I would happily put my arm around her waist or shake his hand, but to curtsy and bow would not fit with my Australian culture. But around the rest of the world, Australian culture is not the norm. And there are many people who natively and naturally understand that when royalty enters the room, it is appropriate to curtsy or bow. When our Prime Minister placed his hand around the constitutional monarch of our country, he was labelled the Lizard of Oz and no smarter than a reptile, according to the British press. Paul, instead, was celebrated by, like, by closet Republicans like me as refusing to treat the Queen as anything more than an equal. But if we are to understand Daniel 11, let's take our cue from Lady Gaga and not Paul Keating. For if we were to survey Daniel 11, we would see that there are kingdoms rising and falling. And what we need to understand is that in human history, people party for a period and then it's over. I don't expect you to read the fine print. I don't even expect you to read the blueprint. But the blueprint, for those of you who have got 40-20 vision, come from Hebrew and Aramaic words that are indicating elevation. Daniel 11 is entirely on the screen in one um, passage of very, very small print. But you can see those little blue spots all the way through. There are kingdoms that are being lifted up, that are magnifying themselves, that are standing up, that are, that are being elevated. But as much as they stand up, the orange print there is indicating that they also fall down. History teaches us one thing. Any kingdom that is built on principles other than righteousness and truth will prosper only for a time. They will come to an end. They will be broken. 
They will have no strength to stand. They will stumble and fall. Daniel 11 becomes confusing to us only if we feel determined to apply every word to some historical application and if our knowledge of history is not adequate, we can run into trouble. But if we stand back and stop reading the individual words but just see what Daniel 11 is really trying to say, it's trying to say this. Daniel, there are times of persecution and hardship. There are times of war and trouble ahead. But don't ever be afraid of any pompous person on the throne. They will eventually come to their end and no one will help them. The simplest and clearest of all Daniel's vision tell us that every kingdom has its cycle. It rises up and then it falls down. It will not be until a kingdom made without human hands collides with earthly powers that there will be a kingdom that will be built that will endure forever. And it's also true in our own personal stories. Daniel 11 stands as a warning for us to build our stories on principles that are at the centre of God's government. God's government, God's throne is established on principles of what is right and what is just. There are endless cycles in human history of kingdoms that started well, where justice and kindness prevailed, but power and privilege tend to distort our priorities, and what started well ended in shame. Dominion given to us in the beginning has been transformed from a concept where we have been called to be stewards and caretakers to instead being those who exercise force and power to accumulate privilege to themselves and not share it with others. Have you seen that in your own time? From early primary school, where one of your peers is is appointed as a um, hall monitor, or maybe they're given some other fancy title, and all of a sudden they rise up with pride above you and make you feel small. Have you lived through that? I think I've told you the story before where on one of the Pathfinder campouts um, I was invited to be a security officer and they gave me a walkie-talkie and a big torch and I remember going up to this huge Samoan, huge Samoan who was breaking curfew by one minute and ordering him to bed. Nick, I think you know enough about martial arts to know that that Samoan with one fell swoop could have just laid me flat. But that vest and that walkie-talkie and that torch and being able to speak language to the head of security just went to my head and I felt capable of taking on this large Samoan. Dominion given to men is given at a risk. Would you agree? Power tends to go to people's heads. And as these kingdoms rise, they begin to use techniques and strategies that are anything but like God. Again, I don't expect you to read the print, but all of the terms there in red as we go through Daniel 11 indicate that the kings of the north and the kings of the south and those that were harassing and causing um, trouble to God's people built their kingdoms on principles other than truth and righteousness. We see kingdoms buying power, using violence, practicing deception, oppressing others, speaking lies, using smooth words, becoming godless, acting wickedly, showing no regard for history, setting up alternative narratives, favoring those who support them, distributing assets unfairly, destroying and annihilating many. What has been still is. Have you been affected by people in positions of power and privilege that have abused it for their own personal gain? Without the transforming love of Jesus working in your life, giving power to anybody is a risk. Over many, many millennia of human history, we have woven into our own political systems fail-safe messages called democracy, where if any particularly political power seems to be going off track or 
going astray. We have the power to vote them out. And luckily in Australia, that's generally a relatively peaceful process. But there are many people here today in this audience who will have relatives that live in nations and countries where political instability is often turned over by revolution and where bloodshed is spread. Human history has too many chapters in it of war and great hardship. But human history will not be like this forever. Daniel 11 is the messy bit in the middle of a literary unit that begins with God telling us how much we are loved and ends up by telling us how we all will be delivered. However bold and proud the person in power may be, Daniel 11 ends like this. He will come to his end and none will help him. And then that beautiful opening verse of Daniel chapter 12. At that time, Michael, whose name means one like God, he will stand up. And when he stands up, our story will turn and we will be delivered. Michael's kingdom will be established on judgments that are true and righteous. Are you attracted to wisdom, strength and riches? God shows us what true wisdom is like. He shows us what true power is like. He shows us what true riches are like. And it is only when you know God that you are truly rich, truly powerful, and truly strong. God doesn't want us to covet dominion to further our own personal agenda. God wants to put us in dominion so that we can exercise loving kindness and truth and justice. If we want to be part of a kingdom that will last forever, we need to love what God loves and live as he lives. Are we savage or are we civilised? When Michael stands up, will we fall down and worship him? I pray that we will. Amen. Father, throughout human history, people have sat on the throne to see what they could get. How big and how powerful and how brilliant could be their empire. But you left your throne to see how much you could give. And it is because of this that your kingdom will not fall down. When you stand up, you'll stay up. May we fall down and worship you, both now and forever is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.